Hello, everyone. Welcome to the third program of the Itasca Waters Practical Water Wisdom Series. Thanks for taking time today to attend this session. We really appreciate that you care about water quality. I'm Stephanie Kessler, your host for today's program. Itasca Waters is a local nonprofit that has been active in Itasca County since 2009. If you haven't done so, you can check out our many accomplishments on our website, itascawaters.org, where you can also access a treasure trove of clean water practices. But in brief, our goal has been to find grants to do research on local water quality and to do educational events such as this one to share that knowledge. We have an outstanding lineup of speakers for our series through 2022 and hope that you will gain new ideas and strategies for keeping your water healthy. We thank our partners for making these events possible. The Grand Rapids Area Community Foundation Fund, Minnesota Sea Grant, Itasca Soil and Water Conservation District, Itasca Coalition of Lake Associations, Rapids Radio, KAXE, KBXE Radio, and the Blandin Foundation. Hosting the question and answer section today will be Itasca Waters board member and manager of the Itasca County AIS program, Bill Granches. The format for today's session will be this. Our speaker will discuss the science behind the topic and then give you some strategies and actions that you can use at your property. That will be followed by an opportunity to ask questions. To ask questions, Simply click on Q&A at the bottom of your screen and type a brief question into the dialog box. You can do that at any time during our speaker's presentation, and Bill will read those questions to our speaker during the Q&A section. Similar questions may be combined, and we may not get to all the questions if we run out of time. This program is being recorded and will be available for viewing online through our website, itaskawaters.org. Finally, we value your opinion and hope you will complete the evaluation form that will be sent to you by email after today's session. Our topic today is septic secrets, protecting our water with good systems. And our speaker today has an outstanding resume. Dr. Sarah Hager is a researcher and instructor in the on-site sewage treatment program in the Water Resources Center at the University of Minnesota. Since 1999, she has been providing education and technical assistance to homeowners, small communities, on-site professionals, and local units of government regarding on-site wastewater treatment. Sarah coordinates the research program at the U and is currently serving as the principal investigator on projects evaluating wastewater treatment at rest areas, and she is developing training related to the land application of industrial wastewater. Dr. Hager is on the faculty of the Water Resources Science Program, teaching sustainable waste management engineering. She presents at local and national training events related to the design, installation, and management of septic systems and related research. Sarah is the president of the National On-Site Wastewater Recycling Association, serves on the NSF International Committee on Wastewater Treatment Systems, and also is the chair of the Minnesota State Advisory Committee on Decentralized Systems. But for the next hour, Dr. Hager is all ours. Sarah, welcome to Itasca Water's Practical Water Wisdom Series. Take it away. All right, thank you so much. I first want to uh, thank the organization for inviting me to speak. And I secondly just want to thank you all for taking time out of a beautiful day. Um, I heard it was beautiful in Northern Minnesota as well as it is um, in the Twin Cities today. So anytime people are willing to get together to talk about septic systems, that makes me really happy. Um, as you heard from my resume, for nearly 25 years, I've been um, working in the septic system arena, and I never thought when I was a little girl this is what I'd be doing, what I'd be doing, but I actually really enjoy um, the combination of taking the science background I have um, and doing education, and sometimes, as you can see here in the picture in the top left corner, 
um, getting my hands dirty as well. So with that, I'm gonna get into the content because we don't have a lot of time together. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the science. We're then gonna get into a little bit about how septic systems are designed, but we're gonna more focus on what you all can do to take care of your septic systems. And finally, we'll leave um, some good time at the end for questions. But I do want us to all take a look at this picture because it's really why we're here today. And that is the water that is used in our homes is recycled back into the environment. Um, when you, The next time you flush the toilet, Someday in the future, someone's going to want to use that water again. And it might be for drinking water. It might be for recreating in a lake, river, or stream. So it's really important that septic systems be designed correctly and actually be used properly uh, because we really do fit into this overall hydrologic cycle. So getting into the science. So this image shows a conventional septic system in someone's backyard. You can see they have their well bringing water into the house. Uh, then wastewater again is gonna flow through the septic tank, which we'll talk about the treatment that occurs there. And then it goes out to a couple different types of soil treatment systems. So sometimes those are called drain fields. Some of you may have mound systems where a majority of the actual treatment occurs um, is in that soil. So our goal is, again, before that water reaches groundwater, bedrock, um, your nearby lake, that the majority, the vast majority of the contaminants have been removed and that water is safe to use again. So a typical decentralized wastewater treatment system, or as we call them septic systems, um, really have a couple stages. The first stage is what occurs in, in the septic tank, and that is referred to as primary treatment or anaerobic digestion. Uh, the final treatment and disinfection, particularly of the harmful viruses and bacteria, happens in a subsurface soil treatment system. So that's the acronym, the SSTS, that we use here in Minnesota. So beneath where the sewage enters the soil, we need to have three feet of unsaturated soil. There are other options out there, more advanced treatment systems, uh, they're not very common because our conventional systems are the least costly option, but when you have a challenging site or soil condition or larger community or cluster systems, that's when um, more advanced technology may be needed to deal with those contaminants. So what this kind of looks like more on a 3D uh, view is again, the wastewater flows out of people's homes. Most of the time, if we're lucky, that happens to be a gravity. Every once in a while, people may need to have a pump in their basement to deal with lower elevation development of sewage. If you have your laundry down there, or sometimes a toilet. Um, but generally, it flows via gravity. It then goes into that septic tank. And your layout may not look exactly like the images that I'm showing. Sometimes people have more than one tank. You may or may not see these manholes, but all septic tanks have large diameter accesses. Sometimes though they're buried six to 12 inches below ground. And in this case, you can see then it's also flowing by gravity to a soil treatment system. I would say it's getting more and more common though that systems do have a pump in them. Uh, the pump again helps get the sewage where it needs to be to help it be spread out over the soil treatment system. And those pumps are very reliable. If you have a well pump, very similar technology, 10 to 15 years is very typical as far as how long those pumps last. So I do wanna point out uh, in that bottom right corner, you'll see it says three foot separation to limiting condition. And that is the critical um, component of septic system design that assures us that that wastewater is being properly treated before it meets a limiting condition of saturated soil or bedrock. So one quick question for you, we didn't set this up so you don't need to answer it, but you can all answer it in your head. And that is how many people in Minnesota have, um, uh, is their primary residence served with a septic system? I often find people when they estimate this go a little low. Uh, the actual number is uh, 32%. So you'll see nearly a third of Minnesotans uh, use septic systems to treat and recycle their water back to the environment. So how we've gotten to where we are today, um, in the mid 70s up to 1995, we had voluntary rules. So it was kind of 
some counties had adopted them, some hadn't. Same with our septic system professionals, our installers and our pumpers. Um, it was a voluntary program, but what you'll see is in the mid 70s is when our program started both at the state and at the University of Minnesota. In 1996, we got statewide rules, which was a big um, time in our, in our septic system evolution that there were some big changes made in some um, jurisdictions. So you'll see as of 2019, there were over 600,000 septic systems in Minnesota, 32% of our households. If you take that and multiply it all together, that's nearly 42 billion gallons of wastewater every year that are treated in septic systems. And it's estimated that 25%, so right, a quarter, you look at that, 608, you know, you're looking at over 225,000 septic systems are in shoreland. And so those systems, again, if not adequately treating wastewater, have the risk of negatively impacting lakes, rivers, and streams. So why is wastewater treatment so important? So we need to clean up our used and dirty water. When the water leaves our homes, ironically, it's 99% water, but that 1% if it gets out into the environment, it can harm both uh, public health and the, and the environment. So when we are sick with any illness, we shed those viruses and bacteria in our human waste. So that's from us directly when we use the toilet, but also from our laundering of our clothing. Uh, when you have chicken in your sink, it has salmonella on it. So there's just many sources of bacteria and viruses that are present in our wastewater. Also sewage contains organic material, nitrogen and phosphorus, all which have the risk of impacting um, our environment, particularly when you think about it, our lakes, rivers and streams, but also our groundwater, which we use as our drinking water source, most of us in Minnesota. So how do we deal with these? Well, the first piece again is that septic tank. Its number one job is to catch the solids. So it's going to do two things with the solids. One is some of them are going to settle out, um, but it's also going to be, there's going to be a decomposition process. When we consume food into our bodies, right, the, the bacteria we have in our guts and in our intestine systems start breaking down that food. And they also go out to the septic tank and they continue that decomposition process. There's also some things we put down the drain that are not digestible. So those are inorganic solids that will be stored. So that tank is a natural settler. So what will happen is lighter things like uh, soaps, grease, a little bit of toilet paper will float up to the top. Most of the toilet paper breaks down, but heavier things will then settle to the bottom. And so what leaves that tank is much cleaner. It's not clean, it's not safe to drink at that point. But that first step of solids removal and anaerobic digestion is really important. And I don't know if any of you have ever smelled a septic system or a septic tank in particular. Um, some people think they smell stinky because they kind of smell like hydrogen sulfide or methane. I think personally that's a beautiful smell and I hope you're laughing uh, because what that smell is, is it's the smell of anaerobic digestion. And so that tells me that that tank is doing its job. It's continuing that breakdown process. So here's kind of a close up of a septic tank and this is a modern septic tank. And the reason why I say that is it has two risers, one at the inlet and the outlet. Some of our older tanks only had one riser in the middle. So the sewage again comes from your house or from whatever structure that is. And on the way in, there's a baffle. The purpose of that baffle on the way in is to make sure that as the wastewater is coming, it doesn't short circuit the tank. We want that wastewater to spend several days settling and de decomposing. There's a similar baffle on the way out, and that one is even more important because it prevents that scum layer, those oils and greases, from going out to either your pretreatment or your soil treatment system. So this one also, the reason why I say it's modern is the risers are at grade. So all systems that were installed since 2010, it's been required that they be at the surface to facilitate ease and maintenance. It's not to say that if they're buried, you still can't properly maintain your tank, but it's a lot easier um, when they're at grade. The other option I just wanna lay out for septic systems, if you are getting a new one, um, is in your tank, you can have an additional feature, which, which is called an effluent screen. 
it prevents larger diameter solids from potentially leaving your tank. And they're a really inexpensive add-on that can really um, help keep as many solids back in the tank as possible, which is beneficial as far as longevity of your soil treatment system. So again, those are those three layers that are going to form. And a little later, we'll talk about that sludge layer and particularly why maintenance is so uh, needed, but it does get thicker and thicker over time, and that's why we need to clean out the tank. So with that, a little bit about design. Uh, this image is a picture actually at a university facility of a mound system being installed. So uh, with mound systems, sand is brought in to, again, achieve that three feet of separation. And we'll talk more about that coming up here. So with conventional, and sometimes they're now referred to as type one, just in case you hear that, that terminology, these rely upon passive soil treatment, meaning as the wastewater travels either through the natural soil you have or the sand that's brought in with the mound system, soil microbes and the soil itself filters and breaks down those contaminants. For these type of systems, that's where you do need the three feet. So this can be naturally occurring in, a, in systems that are referred to as trenches, beds, or at grades, or we can use mound to uh, as a supplemental natural soil. So as I mentioned earlier, there are other options, options that exist to further pretreat the wastewater uh, prior to the natural soil, but they're not uh, super common in Minnesota. We generally rely around passive soil treatment. So here just shows a picture I showed an earlier image of trench systems, but this is a very simplified version of what a mound system is. So it's just really an elevated trench system where we bring that sand in to achieve the three feet. And that three feet number is based on a lot of research that was actually done here in Minnesota and Wisconsin in the 70s and 80s that looked at how much soil do we need to remove viruses and bacteria and absorb phosphorus. So phosphorus again sticks to the soil and we need to have sufficient soil for that to occur. So this is what that would look like in your backyard. If you have good soil conditions, you may be allowed to, and again, about half of Minnesotans with new systems are allowed to put a system that is below the ground surface. So it really relates on your specific soil conditions in your backyard. So that could be, again, a trench system like you see there. It could be that the distribution media is put right on the surface or with a mound that that's an elevated system. So just showing some real images, this is again a rock trench system. Um, historically, if you go back 10, 20, 30 years, this was the most common system installed um, in Minnesota. But we've now seen um, uh, uh, the, the industry evolve and now the image that you see on the bottom is using uh, recycled plastic as the media to spread the wastewater out in the soil. And whether you use rock or a chamber, which is what you see that in that bottom left corner, the magic or the treatment still happens in the soil. Um, that's just, again, how we kind of spread it out. So the system that just popped up is actually referred to as a bed. It's just a wide trench system. Uh, there in the right corner now, you'll see what's referred to as an at grade. So they put the distribution media or the rock right on the surface. Um, here's a beautiful image of a mound system where you can see the mound, uh, that, sand, that sand that's mounded up and that they're building the distribution system across the top. And finally, what a finished mound might look in someone's backyard. So how we figure out what type of system is needed for a property and how big. The type of system, whether you have a drain field or a mound system, is based on two variables, really. Um, one is how much pretreatment prior to the soil. Most of us are only going to have a septic tank. I mentioned there are other options, such as aerobic treatment units or textile filters that you could further clean up the water. So if you further clean it, you may have uh, some other options because you then don't need to have the 36 inches or three feet. So the next option or the next consideration is really about the soil. So there's really two variables about the soil. One is how much natural unsaturated soil does your property have? Um, and then finally, what are the soil characteristics? And the two critical soil characteristics that can impact the system type are the color of the soil, which I'll show you some images coming up, 
and also the texture, right? Is it is a sandy soil? Is it a loam? Is it a clay? That can also impact the type of system. How large that system needs to be is based on the size of the structure. And when we're talking about homes, that's based upon the number of bedrooms in the house because that really uh, predicts the max maximum occupancy of a home. We don't want to build it for who's living there today. We want to live build it for who may be living there in the future as well. Other things that impact the size of the system could be if a garbage disposal is present, if you're pumping wastewater from the basement, and finally the soil type. So if you take a cup of water and you dump it on sand, what happens? Right, it runs away immediately. If you do that on a clay, what happens then? Well, it tends to pool a little bit and slowly soak away. So as you get more silt and clay in your soil, the larger your soil treatment system needs to be to accept that wastewater. So here's a little bit because it's kind of one of those, it, it kind of gets into a lot of science here. So don't worry if it's, if, if it's a little too much, but when they come out, they will do soil borings typically, or sometimes dig a little soil pit to look at the soil color. The soil color tells us if the soil has been saturated for extended periods of time. And the book you see there is a fancy paint chip book for soil called the Munsell Color Guide, because ultimately we want this to be um, objective. And so our rules lay out that if you have soil colors that are in that box that's drawn on the far left, those soil colors indicate that the soil is wet for extended periods of time. And if that occurs, we need to have it treated prior to that because we don't want to send sewage that hasn't been treated into shallow groundwater. Shallow groundwater is, can, goes one of two places. It either goes to deep groundwater or it moves laterally to a, a lake, river, or stream. So the fancy term for this is called redoxomorphic features. So redoxomorphic features, primarily um, we look at iron. So if the soil is saturated, iron has the ability to move around in the soil. And the image on the right really clearly shows that we have areas that are red and areas that are gray. And that tells that does not happen unless the soil is saturated. The other critical variable that we design around is bedrock. So I don't think this is super common uh, where many of you are located, but there are parts of Minnesota along the North Shore and also in southeastern Minnesota that have bedrock. But sometimes we also have glacial deposits of soil that have a lot of rock mixed in with them. And rock does not adequately treat sewage. So ultimately, we look if more than half of the soil profile is composed of rock, that soil is not uh, counted towards soil treatment. So we set that as a limiting condition. So that's our kind of overview of how systems are designed. And now I'll get to probably what is the most interesting part. And that is uh, both maintenance and then some tips for you all to use at home to help lengthen the life of your system. So maintenance is mandatory. Since we got a state code in 1996, it has said that your system uh, needs to be evaluated and we'll get into the timeline here. But what it says is you have to have your system looked at every three years. So when a septic system professional comes out, what are they going to do? Um, they're going to clean your septic tank or tanks. If you have an effluent screen, they'll clean that as well. They should also, while, you're, while they're visiting, confirm that your alarms are working. So any system that has a pump has an alarm on it. And we want to know that that's going to work if, if and when that pump fails. And finally, they should walk over your septic drain field or mound area just to look for any signs of problems. So I mentioned tank cleaning is critical. So you'll see the image on the right uh, that that tank lid was buried. Uh, so in that six to 12 inch range. And it's really important that that be dug up. Uh, so during that, this tank cleaning, they are going to remove uh, the sludge and stem layers. They end up removing it all because there's no way to just take out the top and the bottom. So this work is done by licensed and bonded professionals. Uh, they are licensed by the MPCA and they're actually referred to as maintainers. And it's not an easy job. Um, I think it was once on the show, Dirty Jobs, which probably isn't surprising. That sludge is kind of a heavier material. So they typically need to do flushing and back flushing. 
Um, in this picture, you'll see he's actually got a pry bar where he's pushing that sludge around. Uh, they actually even make like a blender for your septic tank where they can blend it up to make a flurry um, to get that tank as clean as possible. Keep in mind though, they're not getting into that tank. They're typically not, they may have some water with, but a little bit of sludge stays in, you know, and dirty material, but they need to get it as clean as possible. But that also helps your tank get started back up. So maintenance can only occur through a manhole. So if you look at that image on the right, sometimes with your systems, you may not see the manhole. You may just see inspection pipes. Ironically, that hose will fit into the inspection pipe, but there is no way to get the tank clean. You'll only basically suck out a small area. So never through the inspection pipe. You're also required by state code to get a report from the maintainers and you'll see the list of things, right? The date, the gallons, and then are there any problems? So I think about it when I get my oil changed, they give me the list of, you know, were there other maintenance needed? Are there any problems? They talk to me about, are there any of these repairs I wanna make today? So I recommend you be home when your tank is cleaned. It's a great time also just to ask, how's my system looking? Like how much life do I have left? You know, septic systems don't last forever and they're a big ticket item when they need to be replaced. So understanding, how your system is working um, and asking questions when they're there, I think is a really valuable time, but also getting this report from them to see. And this report doesn't go to the county, it just goes to you. So how often does your tank need to be cleaned? Well, ultimately the state rules do not dictate a time period. What they dictate is that your system has to be evaluated every three years. So some local jurisdictions may say pump, but what the state code says is evaluated. Uh, because at the end of the day, there's kind of two issues. One is a family of two is going to produce a lot more sludge in the same household as a family of six. But the reason why we want every system looked at every three years is what if one of your baffles fell off at year one and a half, and during that one and a half years in between your visit, your scum had been going out to the soil treatment system. We don't want that to be an extenuated time period. So, and this, so this, that's why, again, this applies to seasonal homes and cabins as well. They don't get a pass on that three-year evaluation. You can measure sludge and scum. You don't have to pump the tank just because they're out there. Um, it is typically what's done if you hire a maintainer to come out and they show up with one of those big trucks. They're usually going to clean your tank. But you could ask them um, to actually you know, do the measurement and determine if it needs tank cleaning. You should also, they should be, as well as you, uh, taking a look at your soil treatment system, replacing cracked or missing inspection pipes. Sometimes they can get hit with the lawnmower. Making sure rain and snow melt go away from your system. And many people can see their system every day, but sometimes it's out of sight. So if yours is out of sight, just annually walking the area um, and looking for, um, are there any changes across that area? So a common question I get is what kind of vegetation should be across the top of the system? So we recommend you use plants that prefer dry soil, which I think sounds, I, it sounds ironic to some people, but keep in mind, most of our septic systems are anywhere from 12 to three feet below the ground. And the average vegetation isn't really gonna be pulling up that water. So uh, we don't want to plant something that needs a lot of water, particularly any sort of irrigation across the top of that system. So the nice thing also about something as simple as turf grass is you know, it may go brown or dormant, uh, during dry time periods, but as soon as we get some, some rain, it, it, it comes back to life. Um, so there's some other benefits. This prevents the root systems from interfering with the septic system. Do keep in mind the larger the plant, the more extensive uh, the root system is. We do not recommend planting edible plants such as vegetables and herbs because they need watering and they leave the soil bare come fall. And you should never plant any sort of trees or shrubs over the top of the soil treatment system or let them grow. So I get questions sometimes about, you know, raspberry bushes or, you know, even some of the really woody vines. You just don't want anything with a really extensive woody 
structure growing over the top of your system, which also, if you don't mow, tends to happen in a lot of our, a lot of our sites across Minnesota. Another key thing I just wanted to mention is compaction is bad. So the way septic systems work is they naturally breathe. They naturally have air that the microbes use in the soil. So if you have vehicle traffic, large animals such as horses or a salt lick for your deer, not a good practice over your system because that regular traffic or compaction pushes out the air space that we need for both water movement and oxygen transfer. Um, if you do have tall inspection pipes sticking up above your system, they can be cut flush. Or if you see the image on the right, those are actually really nice landscaping boxes that can make your system look a little bit more aesthetically pleasing in your backyard. So this image on the right was actually uh, taken at a septic system near Ely, where they actually um, have a mound system, a newer mound system that actually has clean outs where we can actually clean out the lines in the system and they're performing a squirt test. I don't know if you can see the water coming up. But if you have one of those systems, you, you will want to consider over time flushing and cleaning your laterals as part of your regular maintenance. So lastly, some homeowner tips, and then I will leave some time for questions. So these are things you can do to extend the life of your septic system. And I'm gonna get into a little bit more detail, but these are kind of the overarching things. One is this to think about how much water you use. So I mentioned two people versus six people is different, but also the way we use water in our homes and how much water we use. And it's not the water per se, it's also what's in the water. So thinking about spreading out your water usage, um, the most obvious example is avoiding something like Saturday laundry day, where do you do all your laundry in one day? Cause that has the risk of too much water moving quickly through your septic tank and stirring things up. Really think about the products you use and limit cleaners. So the thing about most cleaners and sanitizers is they don't know who the good bacteria are and the bad bacteria. So they just indiscriminately kill bacteria. And in both our tank and out in the soil, we rely upon good bacteria uh, to do wastewater treatment for us. You should never be using your system as a garbage can. So if you've lived with the septic system your whole life, you very likely know this, but you may have people that visit your home and just some people who are moving from more city settings to more rural settings do not understand that in particular, your toilet is not a garbage can. So really only human waste and toilet paper are the only things that should be going into a garbage can. And the last thing I really recommend to people is if you are having any sort of problems with drains in your house or you smell septic odors, don't wait for that problem. So a typical problem when a septic system malfunctions is you either have sewage in your basement or sewage in your yard, which nobody wants. So don't wait for the catastrophe, have them come out, have them look at your system. That doesn't mean you need to fix it that day, but you may be able to plan for the future and, and determine what is the problem. And sometimes it's an easy fix. So now I'm gonna get into the tips. Uh, room by room a little bit, uh, but the key thing I want to just point out is where we use water in our home. You'll see most of the water usage in a typical home is in the bathroom with the toilet being the number one water using device, uh, then bathing and laundry is another important source of water. So I'm going to touch on each of these coming up and give you a few tips. So the first one is the toilet. So if your bathroom looks like the image on the right, I can tell you both your septic system and your realtor would like you to probably remodel. I don't need you to remodel, but I would consider replacing that toilet because that toilet on uh, the right there uses five to seven gallons every time you flush, where the new ones are using 1.3 gallons or less. Or you may even consider a dual flush toilet. Um, I recently installed one, works great, right? So with urine, you use the little flush and when you have a bigger job, you, you then use the 1.3 gallon. And they really have gotten a lot better, meaning there's very little um, staining of the bowl. We don't wanna have to flush twice because that defeats the purpose. The other really big issue with to toilets is leaks. And if you ever are wondering if your toilet leaks, put a drop of food coloring in the back, and if your toilet bowl turns that color, you know you have a leak. 
sometimes we know we have it when you're jiggling the handle to get that uh, the it to seep and prevent, because um, that can be hundreds of gallons if that's the issue with your toilet. Also be careful with what you clean your toilets with. Dogs are not recommended, they make a mess. Uh, they're probably a cleaner option than some of the other sanitizers out there. Uh, in general, san uh, toilet cleaners are very caustic and very hard on septic systems. So consider using more elbow grease than chemicals, using baking soda or Bonami. Bonami is just a cleanser type product that's non-abrasive and a brush. Um, if you're having issue with hard water or lime deposits, um, I would recommend trying hot white vinegar. So anything that you can consume is going to be better for your septic system than the product I used growing up, which is called Iron Out, which you didn't want to breathe. You didn't want it to touch your skin not good for your septic system. So moving on to laundry, this is another spot. The next time you're, you know, it's time for a new washing machine, really consider installing either a front loading washing machine or an efficient top loader. They use a lot less water. You're going from 40 or 50 gallons a load to as low as 12. In the long run, even though they cost a little more, you also use less electricity and certainly think about spreading out your load. Another tip I like to pass on is when you wash your clothes, more lint comes off in your washing machine than your dryer. All of us have a lint filter on our dryer, but very few of us have a lint filter on our washing machine, which means all those tiny little fibers, which are referred to as microfibers, go out with that laundry water and go out to our septic tank. Some of them may settle out, but some of them may make their way through to our soil treatment system. And unfortunately, some of those synthetic fibers we are now wearing, um, the soil can't break down. So as much as possible, if we can hold those back, either with a screen or a pantyhose, if you have a discharge line, there are also aftermarket lint filters. Uh, that image there on the right, the filter all is actually a Minnesota company. Um, and I have one of those and, you know, it really depends on how much laundry you do and what kind of things you're washing. But typically uh, mine catches also a lot of dog hair <laughs> that gets washed off um, some of our, our items. Um, so that has to be cleaned, you know, typically about once a week, uh, that canister, but it stops that from going down the drain. So I think the last area here to touch on is the kitchen. Um, dishwashing, dishwashers actually use less water than hand washing. So if you have a dishwasher, just make sure that your loads are full when you're running them. Make sure your detergent doesn't have phosphorus in it and try as much as possible to, to scrape your plates ahead of time and not into the sink. Um, in your sink, the biggest issue is fats and oils any sort of fat or oil from the fry daddy, from the bacon, all of that should not be going down the drain. And that should be dealt with um, as a solid waste. So the last thing I wanted to touch on is garbage disposals. I'm not a fan of them. I'm a big fan of composting your food waste. The problem of garbage disposals are they are adding undigested food, right? So when I eat a piece of broccoli, right, my body starts the breakdown process and takes those complex things and makes them into much simpler proteins and easier for the septic system to continue to digest. The other thing that garbage disposals do is they grind up solids into little pieces and little pieces do not settle out as well um, in the septic tank. So the recommendation again is if you are remodeling or building a new home is to not install one you already live in a house that has one is to just not use it or use it very minimally. Our code does require if a home has a garbage disposal um, that you make your tank bigger. So there is a little bit of safety factor and this isn't actually some other states don't do this, but in Minnesota, we have a little safety factor to allow for more sludge and scum, but I have still seen food make it out to the soil treatment system. So it can increase the need for care and maintenance particularly if you are someone who really enjoys using your garbage disposal. So with that, that is what I have prepared because I wanted to make sure we had time to answer all of your questions. Um, I will tell you, this is an image of our website. It has a wealth of information, um, more than you might ever want to know about septic systems. And you'll actually see if you kind of 
go across the top there, there's a section that says septic system owners. So that is a great place to look for additional resources. I'm also happy in the future, if we're not able to get to your question today, my email address is listed right there, um, but hopefully we can get through most of your questions today. Great, thank you so much, Sarah. That was really, really good information. Now I'd like to bring in Itasca Waters board member and manager of the Itasca County AIS program, Bill Granches for the Q&A section. Bill? Thank you, Stephanie. Hello and welcome to the Q&A section of today's program. Now please submit your questions in writing by clicking the Q&A icon. We will not be using the chat function. I'll read the questions out loud and they will be answered by Dr. Hager. We may combine some of similar questions and we may not get to all of your questions, but please feel free to email us after the program uh, if you have any unanswered questions. So let's begin. Our first question for Dr. Hager is, the grass over my system is brown and looks dead. What is the likely cause? The septic system? What can I do? Hmm. I would like to know a little bit how old the system is. So when systems are first installed, um, you know, it sounds like vegetation got established across, but now it's brown. So my one concern is uh, when the seed was put down was, um, was it compacted all over the surface? So grass doesn't grow real well in compacted soils. But what also can, and was their topsoil place? So the upper six inches to really adequately grow vegetation needs to be topsoil. And that is a, you know, a requirement in our code with new systems that there be topsoil. So that is something that could be brought in. You could bring in some additional topsoil. Uh, but the other likely reason that sometimes the grass can be brown is because it's not getting water, right? So it's not getting water from the septic system itself because the roots can't get to where that water is. Um, we in general don't recommend people water over the top of their system because ultimately, you know, if you look at a typical system, a couple hundred gallons a day, it ends up being about 50,000 gallons of water a year that go through a septic system. So we don't want to add any hydraulic load, but we do tell people to get it established or if you're, you know, really concerned about it dying off, a little light, light, light watering could be done. But my, my most likely explanations would be that the soil was compacted or you don't have good topsoil over that area, particularly if the rest of your yard looks good and that area um, ends up being um, brown. But um, if it's a mound system, the other issue is a lot of the time with mounds, they're actually crowned to shed the water because we don't want that extra rainwater to infiltrate the system. So sometimes there just isn't a lot of water getting to the actual grass. Okay, second question we have is, can we trust labels that say septic safe? No, you can't. So uh, septic safe, that terminology is sheer marketing. Uh, no one regulates it, no one controls it. Um, that doesn't mean that it's a bad product, um, but the best example, and I happen to see something uh, pop up about toilet paper, is there's toilet paper that is marketed septic safe. Um, but, and that means it'll break down. What I have found in my experience is all toilet papers break down. And if you're ever wondering if your toilet paper is safe uh, or the toilet paper you'd like to use or you're concerned about, if you take a, tam a sample of that toilet paper and you put it in a jar, just like a regular old mason jar and shake it for five seconds, it should start breaking down. Ironically, if you do that with Kleenex, if you do that with a sanitizing wipe, they are not flushable. They uh, should never be flushed. Um, they don't break down at all. Q-tips, right? All the kinds of things people sometimes put in their toilets, none of that will, but in general, toilet paper will. So that is the easy test of toilet paper. When it comes to other products that are out there, so I do often get a lot of questions about what kind of cleaner should I use? Things that are labeled biodegradable or septic safe, I feel I have feelings that are be that they're better, but keep in mind that is still not regulated. And I have seen products used or labeled septic safe that I wouldn't consider to be septic safe. Uh, the best example I saw was a, a modification you can make to a clean out outside your house that allowed dog waste to be put into your septic system. Septic systems are not designed for your dog's waste. 
But yet on the Amazon reviews, it said it was septic safe. So you have to be very careful um, with who's saying that and are they trying to market something? Um, and or are they trying to say, oh yeah, you should use this even though it's not. So it, it can be very product specific. Mm -hmm. Well, this is a, a, the next question is related to this. Um, lots of companies sell treatments to add that say will make your system work better. Are those needed? No, they're not needed at all. So there, to date, there is no third party independent research that shows any of the products that are, I generically call them septic system additives, mm -hmm. right? There's some that advertise on TV. If you go to your local big box hardware store, they'll be right on the shelf. Um, but ultimately, there are kind of three things they say. One, they say they feed the bacteria. Well, every time you flush the toilet, you're feeding the bacteria. The second thing is they say they add special bacteria. Well, all the bacteria we need are there. They come from us and they're just naturally occurring. A gram of topsoil, which is like a tiny bit in your hand, has a million microorganisms to a billion. So there's plenty of microbes out there. So they're, they're just to me, I tell people, you're kind of like flushing 20. You're better off taking that money and just getting your system regularly maintained. And maybe someday we will have a product that I could say, yep, we have some research or science on, but we, we don't have that today. Wow. Okay. Uh, next question. What is the life expectancy of septic systems if pumped every two years? So this one's a little harder to answer because it's kind of like asking how long does your car last? Well, right, it depends on how much you drive it. So, um, so if you had a family of two versus, and again, versus a family of six, and they could be living in the same three bedroom house with the same size septic system, in general, the family of two is going to last longer because of septic systems have a finite capacity but I'll, I'll still try to answer the question. We say septic systems should last at, at least 25 years. And they can last certainly much longer than that. But I will also add they don't last forever. Every septic system eventually will malfunction. And usually while, why it mal malfunctions is, is the soil pores become plugged with things the soil can't break down. So that's a gradual process. It doesn't happen overnight, but over a long period of time, um, and so many of you may have septic systems that are well over 25 years and still working well and still may meet regulation. But I would say if your system is over, you know, that 20 plus years, it should be something you're kind of budgeting for or thinking about in the future because it's just like your roof. I remember when I bought my house, uh, I said, you know, the roof was older. And so I said to the inspector, I'm like, well, am I going to need a new one? He goes, well, you don't need one today, but you're going to need one very likely in the next five years. So that was great information. So that's the kind of question you can also ask your maintainer when they're out, is like, how old is my system? And if you don't know that, also go to your county and get the record. So if you've lived there the whole time, you know, but often people don't have that information if they bought a parcel. Yeah, that's me. I just bought mine two years ago. I think I'm gonna have mine looked at uh, this summer. Okay, next question. I have a new system that has a pump that pumps effluent up a grade to a drain field. It has been so wet this year that I noticed the pump is running even when we are not supplying water to the tanks. Is this a concern? The tank itself is supposed to be watertight, I think. Yes, the tank should be watertight, um, but it could be potentially leaking. So if that pump is pumping during time periods when there is no, when there is no usage in the home, it tells you you very likely have infiltration. Mm -hmm. So that is definitely something you want to have looked at because that again can be hundreds or thousands of gallons of water that are, you know, either getting into your tank and stirring things up or getting out to the soil treatment system. Okay. Not something to ignore. Okay, uh, next question. Who should we contact to check the efficiency of our drain field or mound area? Um, any septic system professional could really do this if you were looking to do, so I do wanna make a distinction between an inspection and having a septic system professional out. 
So an inspection is done at a time when you either need to get a permit or you're selling your parcel. And it's a very official process where a set of forms are filled out and those forms go to your permitting authority or your county. If you just want to know how your system is working, you don't want an inspection because an inspection could trigger upgrades and repairs. So if, I, if it was time for maintenance, I would have a maintainer come out and I would tell them when I called them, by the way, when you come out to clean my tank, I'd like you to also walk through my system with me and explain it to me and tell me how it's working. But, um, but really an installer could do this, a designer, an inspector, those are kind of the wide range. And you know, a lot of companies in our industry do all of that work, right? Because in outstate Minnesota, they kind of need to cover all the bases. So, you know, getting someone who understands that kind of broad spectrum of systems um, is what I'd recommend. Yeah, I think we have time for another question here. Um, what can you tell us about peat tanks? So I think they're referring to peat filters. So a peat filter is an advanced treatment system. So you still have a septic tank and then you have what I call secondary treatment. So it further pre-treats the wastewater before it goes out to the soil. So these are uh, more commonly used, as I mentioned before, on smaller parcels where you don't have sufficient area to put in a trench or mound system. Um, I know there's a good handful of them in St. Louis County, for instance, so someone may have heard of them, um, that they're often used there as a solution for difficult sites. So the peat acts as a treatment medium that the sewage runs over the peat and as it's doing that, it gets treated. So the effluent that comes out of a peat filter is similar to the effluent that comes out of a wastewater treatment plant. So it's very clean, still has to go through a so the soil treatment to get that final treatment um, to occur. Okay, one last question here. What is the greatest danger for a septic system? Hmm. Hmm. Uh, that's it's, it's a hard one for me to answer. Um, so from a property owner standpoint, I, if I were, let's say I was going to buy a property, what would I, number one thing I'd want to know, right? I'd want to know one that it was a good system. So, and that's really figured out during the inspection process. I would never buy a parcel that the system hadn't been inspected. But the thing that I don't know, um, or that would, could be the biggest concern is, has that system been properly maintained? Right? Would any of you buy a car if they told you they'd never change the oil? Of course not, right? So with septic systems, again, the question is, have they properly maintained the system over? So that's, again, the number one thing you can do is make sure that you're properly maintaining that system. Because it really is the distinction between having a septic system and being connected to a wastewater treatment plant, right? They have an operator that takes care of their system. Who takes care of your septic system? You are the operator. So that, that I think is the biggest risk is people who don't really understand their septic systems and don't take proper care of them. Let's see, well, thank you everyone for all those great questions. Now, before we give it back to Stephanie to wrap up, I'd like to tell you uh, that in addition to these monthly series on the first Thursdays, the Tasca Water is offering an opportunity to become an aquatic invasive species detector. Uh, if you have a substantial interest in Tasca County Waters or would like to learn more, go to TascaWaters.org or use this QR code on the screen. You should register as soon as possible because some of this is self-paced and then uh, there's probably about six to eight hours of self-paced study before the two-day online course uh, that is scheduled to take place uh, from 9 to noon on June 13th and 14th. This is really a fantastic course to, uh, with no obligation for volunteer work associated with it. Um, it's, it's a really great, great way to learn more about aquatic invasive species. Okay, Stephanie, let's get back to you. Okay, thank you. That concludes our program for today. I hope you all enjoyed the third program in the Itasca Waters Practical Water Wisdom Series. Itasca Waters thanks Dr. Sarah Hager for today's excellent program. We thank Bill Granches for hosting the Q&A portion and thanks to Itasca Water board member, Jan Sandberg for handling the background work. Most importantly, we thank you 
for having the interest in clean water and taking the time to be here today. A special thank you goes to the Itasca Waters Education Committee and its partners for all they've done to produce today's program, as well as those to follow this year. Today's program was recorded and will soon be available on our website, itascawaters.org. We will be emailing you an evaluation and we hope that you use it to give us, to give Itasca Waters the feedback it needs to make these programs even better. Our next live program will be at noon on July 7th, entitled Blue Green Algae, What Causes It and Why You Should Care. You can sign up now by going to our website, itaskawaters.org. I'm Stephanie Kessler. Thank you and see you on July 7th. <laughs>